Community Church. We are glad that you are here and excited that you love all your friends and are having wonderful conversations, but we're going to bring it back together. And um, we, uh, we have a few great opportunities for us, and so I'll begin talking about those in just a minute. Just have to wait for the tall guys in front to sit down. There we go. All right. So welcome. We are glad that you are here. And, uh, and it's uh, a great morning of worship already. So fun just to, to worship God, to be in his presence. And uh, if you are here for the first time today, we just want to say welcome and thank you for coming. Uh, we're excited that you're here. We would love to uh, be in contact with you and be able to just communicate more about who we are and what, uh, what we're doing and what, uh, what we sense God doing in our community and how we want to be a part of that. So we have uh, connect cards. You can scan the little thing uh, in front of you on a chair or scan this little thing up here, and it'll take you directly to a card that you can fill out. And we just use that as a way not to spam your email because we know you get 30 of those every morning before you can do anything else. You have to clear out your junk, so we're not going to do that to you. Uh, but it does give us an opportunity uh, to connect with you to be able to uh, just so that we can find out more about you and help you understand more about uh, Community Church and what's going on here. So. Um, my name is Ryan Hickman. I serve on the leadership team here, and our goal at Community Church is really to help you encounter God and begin to grow as a disciple of Jesus. God wants to do transformation in all of our lives, and so as part of that, as part of being part of Community Church, uh, we want to encounter God, and we want to see God begin to change us and to mold us and to make us into people who are useful uh, for his kingdom to do the things that God wants us to do. So we're excited about that. One of the great opportunities that we have coming up, we've talked about this the last three or four weeks. Uh, today is your last day to sign up for this. Who knows what's coming? Summit. Summit that's right. We've got Summit coming up next Saturday from 9 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And today is your last day to be able to sign up for a reduced rate. And we know everybody loves reduced rates, right? Yeah. So there we go. So $15 if you sign up by midnight tonight. Otherwise, it's $25. Either way, it's going to be the best money you've ever spent. Summit is when the group of our network group of Called to Greatness churches all come together for one day out of the year to be able to get words of life, words of encouragement, to hear messages about the vision of where our network is going, what God is calling us to, and really to set us on a course for the next year. And so I know the last time I was up here, I encouraged you that if there's really, if there is one event one event that you can do to take your life and say, hey, I'm going to invest some time, some energy, some resources to get me from point A, not to point B, but to jump you to like point F, G, H, right? Like taking this time, taking these hours and investing it will really catapult you into the coming year. It will catapult your life of faith and help you see more and more about what God is doing and what God wants you to do to be a part of that. So we want to encourage every single one of you to sign up for Summit. Excited about that. And it's coming up when? Next Saturday. Next Saturday. That's right. Next Saturday, 9 to 4. And uh, we look forward to seeing all of you there. If you need help signing up for that, you can obviously go to the little thing that you scan, right? QR code. See, I have a 75-year-old up here telling me it's called a QR code. That's when you know this place is popping, right? You got your, got your 75-year-olds explaining to your 50-year-olds what technology is. So, um, so go to the QR code, or if you need help, you can go to the Welcome Center after church, and somebody can sign you up there. All right, we're going to uh, take up our tithes and offerings now. Um, one of the things that was so encouraging me, to me today, just as we were worshiping, it, the thought occurred to me that God inhabits the praises of his people. And during worship, I mean, you could sense that, that God was here, sense his presence. But as it, as it relates to tithes and offerings sometimes, I think people can either look at it as, 
hey, this is either an obligation or this is just something we do to kind of keep things going. But it, it really does, it ties into worship as well, that God will inhabit the praises of his people. And so when we look at giving as a form of worship, when we look at giving as a form of gratitude and thankfulness and praise to God for what he has done in our life, guess what? God inhabits that, right? That God meets us there, that God becomes part of that. And so my encouragement to all of us today as we give is just to give with a thankful heart, to give with a heart of gratitude, to say, God, thank you for whether it's a, whether it's a massive amount of money or whether it's the little I have. God, I am so thankful for what you have given me and invite God into that place so that God can bless you, so that God can be a blessing with your resources that you use. Amen? So, Father, I thank you that as we come before you today that we can give with a grateful heart. Thank you, God, that you are there, that you are present in our finances, that our finances indicate so much about where our heart is. And Father, we pray that today that our heart would be with you. God, that our heart would say, Father, we are thankful. We are so, so thankful for what you have given us. And out of that, we give back to you so that you can be a blessing to so many more people. So we thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen? All right, if you're giving cash today, uh, we have ushers coming. You can feel free to put that in the buckets as they come down, or you can give online through the QR code. And, um, and in just one second, I will begin to, uh, well, I'll just do it now as the ushers go down. Today, uh, Pastor John is over at Morningstar Church, our sister church in Lawrence. Um, but we are not cheating you. We're bringing in another Pastor John. So it's... So we're getting the benefit. Uh, we have Pastor John McDermott and his wife Pam with us from Lawrence today. And I'm going to tell a couple of quick stories. Is that all right? So Pastor John is one of my favorite people in the world. And it's, and it's not just because he's like fun and nice, uh, but a couple of stories for you. One, when, uh, when Miriam and I first came to Lawrence back in 1995, so like 28 years ago. That's good math right there. So when we first came, Miriam and I got invited to go to lunch with John and Pam. And it wasn't on the, on the best of circumstances. Miriam had demanded that we go to lunch because I was not being a good 21-year-old husband. And, uh, and so in the process of that, I remember sitting down with John and Pam, and as we were talking with them, John just began to ask about our life of faith, and, and I began to rehearse to John my bona fides, like I was, you know, born in a pew. My dad was a pastor. I gave my life to Jesus at the age of five, and, and I listed a few other things, and he looks across, and he goes, okay, but is Jesus the Lord of your life? And I remember thinking in that moment, like, wow, I, I know he's my savior, but I don't know if I have made him the Lord over every area of my life. And John was the first person to ever challenge me in that. And the first person to say, hey, it's not just a decision, it's every decision. Are you making every decision for Jesus? And I'm eternally grateful to John for that and for Pam because Pam is, is of the same heart. And, and another story that kind of reminds me of that, of, of John and Pam is we, one time we were, we were meeting, we're, having like a little conference room session. And we had this guy named Chris come in and Chris has all these wonderful like highfalutin ideas and everything else. He's a great idea guy. And so Pastor John is yes, an idea guy, but also a man of action. And so John is sitting there and finally he goes, fine, 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 okay, okay, I get it. Now give us an answer. And Chris just reaches over, grabs this marker, and then goes up to the whiteboard, and he writes this huge dollar sign <laughs> on the whiteboard, and then he turns around and he goes, they don't pay me for solutions, I just bring the ideas. <laughs> and John was so irritated. And, and the reason that he was irritated is, is one of the things that I love about John and Pam is that they are men and women a man and a woman um, who, yeah, they're not plurals, but they're a man and a woman who understand 
that yes, we have to have the proper worldview, and they and they work hard to educate and to teach and train about what the Bible says about every area of life. But without putting that into action, things don't change. And so the, their life is a, is a great balance of both knowing the word and doing the word. And I love that about them, and I know that that's what you're going to experience today. So please welcome with me, Pastor John. Thanks. Thank you so much. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, I'll get into a little bit more of this in a few minutes, but I think this is a good time to say this, is that one of the lies uh, that the enemy told me some 41 years ago, right before I gave my life to the Lord, uh, was that if you, thanks Ryan, again, a good friend, is that uh, you're gonna lose all your friends. And, and, and indeed, when I, when I made that commitment and got born again, I did lose all those, all, I lost all my old friends. But, I mean, the, what I've gained, you know, is, is amazing. God, God, you know, like a brother. I think of Ryan really as a brother and Miriam as a sister, not just like, hey, sister or brother, but like a brother. And, you know, that, that the enemy only gives us counterfeit and God gives us the, the real thing. And I have many friends in the room here today and think of you all that way. So uh, thank you for having me here. I'm excited about what God is doing here at Community Church. I think it's a miracle what God is doing, and we're all miracles in many ways. I want to talk to you this morning, and, and I, uh, along the journey, along the journey is the title of this, this message, and um, it's full of stories, and so I'm going to get right to it. Uh, Matthew 5, verse 1 says, seeing the crowds, talking about Jesus, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and here's, the, here's this verse, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And what a powerful scripture, but it's often misunderstood. But, you know, when we think about this term, poor in spirit, it's helpful to understand that it's a, it was a Hebrew idiom. Right, And what an idiom is, is, is a group of words established by usage as having a meaning not deducible from those of the individual words. In other words, you know, kind of like, have you ever heard someone said, hey man, that idea won't hold water? Like you don't get the idea of what that means, hold water, by hold and water. And, and so this poor in spirit is, is a, is an, has an incredibly deep meaning. It has nothing to do with financial poverty or, or any of, of not having a lot of spirit. It has to do with having a certain degree of humility and a, that, that causes you to understand how much you need God. So that, that's a, a humility to recognize one's need for God. And so, you know, my life 41, 42, 43 years ago was somebody who really, I knew that I needed God. I grew up Catholic, and my framework of how to get God was somewhat distorted by what my understanding was of Catholicism. And so I grew up wanting to know Jesus. I, I grew up, I remember... Um, when I was eight years old, somehow by myself watched the whole entire four hours of Charlton Heston in the movie Ben-Hur and just like and loved it and uh, loved, re loved looking through, you know, portions of the Bible. Wasn't a Bible really someone that did it regularly, but I, I read it and I loved who Jesus was. And, and so, but my framework was that I never could feel like I could be good enough to that God would accept me. And so when I got to high school, I started a little bit kind of losing. I went to a Catholic high school. I remember reading the Bible and uh, Good News for a Modern Man. 
uh, that, that by miraculously my junior year religion teacher at a Catholic school was a Protestant. And she gave us this New Testament uh, good news for modern man, kind of a, of a modern English translation of the, of the New Testament. And I was reading, and I was reading through the book of Acts. And I came upon the part in, you know, where people were being filled with the Spirit and began to speak in tongues. And so I went to school because I was like, whoa, what is this? In my mind, I was thinking, oh, I probably nuns are doing this late at night in the church basement by candlelight. And so this is, this is wild. And so I went to, to, I had a little, already built up a little bit of a reputation, so I don't fault this nun. But so I went to the nun who was my Spanish teacher, and I said, Sister Teresa, have you ever read in the Bible, like, speaking in tongues? Have you ever spoken in tongues? And she goes, John, you go, you're such a troublemaker. Just go sit down. So that was the impact. So, um, so I, um, I uh, my, my last semester of high school, I got kicked out of my senior year uh, English class. And... Um, they gave me a correspondence to do from KU, and that wasn't, you know, there was no online back then. It was, you mailed it in. And, uh, and so by the time graduation came, um, I should tell you how, why I got kicked out. Um, uh, we had a newer teacher, and it kind of building, and at the beginning of the, 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 the spring semester, we read The Great Gatsby, and we were talking about it, and she began to say how the Great Gatsby was a parallel to the Christ story, and that just that just offended me. I was like, "What? That's no way!" And so every time we read a book, I would Animal Farm. I would say, "It's," the, uh, and I would go on this long explanation, make stuff up, and then say, "And yes, once again, it's a parallel to the Christ story." And so basically, they had threatened me, like, if you, do, if you keep causing trouble, we're going to kick you out of this class, and we don't have another class to put you in. And so the, the, everybody in the class knew that that was the edict, that was the, the threat towards me about, you know, if I ever did that again. And so the next, the next book that we, we wrote, read, um, I think it was the, the one about the, the rabbits, uh, Watership Down. And, uh, and so everybody was building the day we were going to start discussing it. There was just all, they had me sitting up front, so, you know, <laughs> all the eyes I could feel bearing down on me. And they were like, hey, is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? And so ultimately, I really milked it. I went on for quite a while and started making stuff up and then go, yes. And once again, it's a parallel to the Christ story. <laughs> And she said, out, out, out. So that was it. And so I wound up, they let me go through graduation, but when I got my diploma, it was, it was you know, the little case uh, for the diploma. It, I opened it up and it was blank. It was empty. So I didn't graduate from Lucky High School in Manhattan. And so I went through and I just, I started working. I got a job at Griffith Lumber. I was working at a lumber yard. Um, I had this girlfriend. I hadn't had her very long, and I don't even remember her name. Pam said, you must not have been a very good boyfriend, and I wasn't. <laughs> and so I uh, smoked a lot of pot, and, and it, you know, it was fun. I was having fun. I was, it was a lot of fun. I had roomed with a, a guy, and the, we had the people coming over all the time. It was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. But then in that, that summer of 81, I was asleep in bed, and something woke me up. And I heard a voice saying, John, if you don't leave Manhattan, you're going to be like this the rest of your life. And that, that just the realization of like, man, I don't want to be like this. No matter how much fun I feel like I'm having, I know I'm not. I, I'm, I, I got to get out of here. So I left. I traveled around a little bit, wound up at Fort Hay State, uh, which was just... A kind of still not born again, just kind of not knowing what, you know, not knowing what's going on, how I want Jesus, but my life is starting to spiral out of control. I'm losing hope. I didn't do very well at Fort Hay State. I came back. Uh, my dad got me this incredibly difficult job on purpose. And 
I was working this job, somebody died on the job, and again, this thought came back to me. Man, if my life doesn't change, something doesn't change, I'm gonna be like this the rest of my life. And, and this is, I know that I, I know there's something more, but I was looking for something transcendent, and uh, there was nothing I could see. So I wound up transferring, because there was no way, my dad said, you're not going back to Fort Hay State, so uh, this is your last chance. So I went to KU, and while at KU, you know, I lived off campus, I kind of went to class, I was kind of trying to think, okay, I'm going to try to get trying, trying, trying. Make a long story short, I walked on campus back in November of, this is now 1982, and I come across this sign for a rock and roll seminar. It's like, wow, okay, this is interesting. And it's like a spiritual expose of rock music. And it's like, wow, this is interesting. So. I wound up going to it, and it was, and many of you probably uh, might, rem some of you might remember, but back in the 80s, there was exposés, Christians were doing exposés on the spiritual roots of a lot of that dark rock and roll music at the time, you know, that there was s embedded satanic messages in the music, there was things going on in the music, and there was definitely just outwardly, you know, demonic, satanic imagery in the album covers and in the music. And so I go and I hear this, and uh, it, it leaves an incredible impact. I leave there that understanding that it's not just me trying to be good enough that Jesus will accept me, but there is an intelligent force of lies and darkness trying to keep me from knowing Jesus. And I was impacted by that. And I went and I walked up front, uh, and Rice Brooks, who's the one that was doing the presentation, he put his arm, he put his hand on my shoulder and said, Hey man, you should come back tonight. We're gonna be doing a, uh, you know, we're gonna do a little be a Bible study, and you you would enjoy it. And so the rest that was around noon, and the rest of the day I was in this you know just war going on in my mind. I'll go. Yeah, I'll go to that. No, 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 I'm not going to go. Ah, maybe I'll go. I'll go, I'll go. No, no. So that kind of continued to transpire quite a bit. And then finally, I, was, I, was, I, would, took a, I would take a bus up to KU campus. And so I started walking to the bus stop, and I said, ah, I'm not going to go. But I went into this record store. And I started looking through the records, and I'd already kind of decided I wasn't going to go. And uh, as I was done there, I got out, I left, and as I was walking to the intersection, this bus comes to the intersection, and the light, I'm sitting there looking because I'm going to cross it, the light goes green, yellow, red, seemingly really fast. And the bus now is stopped right in front of me. And I go, okay, I guess I'll go. And so as I'm going around and getting on the bus, the bus driver, and this is wild, it, you know, I didn't realize it at the time that this would have such significance. But the bus driver said, hey, you're lucky I'm a substitute bus driver. Because a normal bus driver would never let you on. This is not a bus stop. I took the bus up to the KU, went to the meeting, and I sat there, and it was, I heard the, I heard the gospel preached in a way that was like incredibly, like the Bible became, came alive. And I was there, and my heart was warm to it, and, and my faith was beginning to be encouraged about, you know, just what God, how, what Jesus thought and what he did. And then the guy did something that maybe some of you have experienced. He said, hey, let's, I want everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. And I want to pray. And he began to pray. And then at the end of his prayer, he said, if you're here and you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to stand up. So I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking about this. And I'm just, I've got my hand, head in my hands. And I just say out loud, quietly to myself, I said, or to Jesus, I said, Jesus, I've tried to be a Christian. I've tried to do this. I just can't do it. I'm not, you know, and basically it was like, I'm not going to stand up because it's another one of these attempts 
to try to do better. And in my heart, like significantly, I heard Jesus speak to me. He said, John, you're right. You can't do it. But if you will trust me, I will do it. And in an instant like that, I stood up. But everything, everything I'd always known about Jesus, why, why Jesus died on the cross? He died on the cross not as an example of his sacrifice and love for the Father, which is, you could say that, that that is in it, in his obedience, but he died on the cross to do for me and for us what we could not do for ourselves. And it just amazingly hit me, and so I stood up, and the guy goes, hey, why did you stand up? I mean, it was, it, it was back in those days. It wasn't this, you know, tender-hearted gospel. <laughs> Why'd you, hey, what's up? Why'd you stand up? And I just said, I'm a sinner. I want to get right with Jesus. I, you know, I never really heard that. It just came out. Just the realization. And so people, you know, afterwards, you know, there was just a feeling of just freedom that happened that just my, something, something transcended, transformed me on the inside, just layers of guilt and shame and, you know, seemingly bondage to sin just was broken. And the, they, someone, someone was smart enough to begin to, to kind of even like what you would say disciple. They gave me a, a Bible study about water baptism and baptism in the Holy Spirit. And they gave me their Bible. And they, they, they didn't know me. They didn't know if I was going to come back. It was a really nice Bible. They said, hey, take this. Go home, study it, do it, come back the next night. I did that. But as I went back into my apartment, I saw that these, these chairs, these really nice lawn chairs, really nice, and I had stolen them. <laughs> and so I was like, I can't accept these stolen chairs. I'm taking them back. And so I, one by one, I ran those chairs back to the person's porch that I had stolen them from, because that was all I had in my living room. So I took them back. <laughs> Better to have no chairs where love is than chairs where there's all hell. So <laughs> I, I, I took them back. And the next morning when I woke up and looked out, the chairs were gone, because I think the people thought, hey, get those inside. We don't know. Maybe they'll change their mind. They'll steal them again. So I'd gone by. Anyway, it's another story. So. <laughs> So it was amazing. And I began to, you know, grow in my walk with the Lord. I surround, there were some great people that were, were uh, in, in there at KU and were helping me to grow. And some great people that are still good friends of mine that are, you know, ta they talked to me and they, I was reading my Bible. I started to get discipled. I was reading my Bible regularly. And, you know, my life began to grow. It really did. I began to really hear God and have uh, just having moments where I knew I was encountering Jesus, like he was speaking to me through his word. And it was amazing. My life was transformed, and God was giving me incredible people to live my life with. Which brings me to this second verse, Matthew 4, 17. It says, from that time... Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about repenting and what that is, because I kind of just illustrated what repenting was. But repent, but it says, it's interesting. It says, repent for, right? Repent for. And so the repent for isn't not, it's not primary to the, the primary reason in this verse to go, that you repent, isn't to go to heaven when you die. Isn't that interesting? Here's Jesus. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so that, that verse became part of the thought process that I, early on in my Christian walk, began to develop. That it's not that this repentance isn't for going to heaven when you die. Although that's included, right? It's like, you know, we, we, that's some place we all want to go.
but it's about the kingdom of heaven. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is what? It's at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, you know? And, and, and when you think about that meaning of that, at hand, what does it mean? That means it's accessible. It's at hand. Hey, do you have a, hey, you got, do you got a pen on hand, right? Hey, do you have a hammer on hand? Right, right. It's something that you can access, that the kingdom of God is here. And so it made me, it made me this idea that the kingdom of God is here, and the scripture is like, seek first the kingdom. It began to make me ask questions about my, my life. Like, what am I doing here? Right? These are questions that I began to ask. What am I doing here? Okay, with, if the kingdom of God is at hand, it's here, it has, it, there's something significant about that. What am I doing here? What is my purpose in light of the fact that the kingdom of God is here? What is the reality of my life choices? You know, and begin to start thinking, not about my life, but about how my life is, am I an asset to the kingdom of God? Or am I a detriment to the kingdom of God? And I began to read the parables because the all, most of all the parables are what? Parables about what? The kingdom of God. Look at them. The kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. The parables are about the kingdom of God. Not about how you get to heaven when you die. And these things began to change me and reprioritize. It made me change my hierarchy of values. And the kingdom of God then became the measuring stick for my life. For what is valuable and what isn't. And, you know, so, so much to the fact that after that end of that first year of college, I went to an evangelism seminar and that, that the guy who led me to the Lord, Rice Brooks, was doing. And I heard a presentation about reaching international students. So here I was living in a kind of a comfortable Christian ghetto with a bunch of Christians. And, you know, we had warm fellowship and we stayed up late at night and we talked and we visited. And it was good. It was great for me. But I started thinking, man, wait a second. Reaching international students, they all live uh, at McCollum Hall at the University of Kansas campus. So all the so many leaders from around the world are in Lawrence living in one location. So where am I going to go live? McCollum Hall. I got a friend, Brian Wagner, a guy that got saved about the same time. I said, hey, let's go. Man, let's go to McCollum Hall. Let's go reach international students and just start. So it was, it was a phenomenal time that we were there living and that same year, you know, as I was focused on wanting to see God do something and use me to change the campus, to change the world, Pam comes to KU. And I, visit, I see Pam. We meet at, at church. And it was a very small church at the time. But I met Pam, and then we had a little picnic after, and I saw her, and I was like, oh, man. Oh, Wow. And, and I was like, I think God told me that this is the one for you. I'm pretty sure that. But it, was, it wasn't until six years later that we began to, to. But, I mean, I, she was so incredible. She had just gotten saved almost about the same time I did, but she was uh, the summer before her senior year of high school. So, but we got saved about the same time, but I'm a year ahead of her in school. But one funny story, I got to tell this. So, um, so I, I really like Pam, and we're just friends, you know, at the time, although um, I really admired her. So um, I saw her on campus, and so we were, it's out in front of one of the big buildings in campus, Strong Hall. And so I'm talking to her, and she's like, oh, how you doing? Okay. And she had a friend there, and it's like, okay, good seeing you, blah, 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 whatever. And so I start up these stairs, walking up these stairs. And then I remember, oh, I forgot to tell her something. And so as I'm trying to tell her, I turn around, I lose my balance, and I fall backwards into these big evergreen bushes with my feet sticking straight up in the air. And you know, if you've ever fallen into some evergreen bushes, 
they're not the easiest thing to get out of. <laughs> and so I'm literally sitting there with this, like a turtle. Can't get, you know, please somebody turn me back over. And so finally I struggle out of the bushes and I, you know, kind of get those little things off. And, I, and then I look down and act like nothing happened. <laughs> And, and so Pam, Pam, Pam and I have thought, that's when I fell for her, so. <laughs> but the next year, Pam and I ran for student body president and vice president at KU together. It had an enormous um, impact, a lot of fun, gotten to speak out. Um, and what's really prophetic is the name, think about this, the name of our party, you know, when you run for student body president, big universities, you, you, you get a, a party or a coalition. Well, we decided to name our coalition, our party, the Reality Coalition. The reality. I mean, come on, that's, that's still being able to be marketed today, right? Like, hey, we're for reality. Wait, what? Yeah, reality. Truth. Okay. So um, anyway, as I begin to slow down and close, uh, I'm not closing yet, I'm just beginning to close. <laughs> so after we graduated from college, we raised our partnership team and we went into campus ministry. And currently we, we have five adult children. We got married in 1989. We have five adult children and seven grandchildren. And it seems like they all live, you know, within a five foot perimeter around our house. <laughs> so. Uh, but I want to share this, Galatians 3, verses uh, 1 through 5. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? I want, to, I want to talk to you a little bit and give you some historical examples of this. By works of the law or hearing with faith. Are you so foolish? Think about this. Are you so foolish having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supply... Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? You know, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I have not been a highly committed person to, like, going to a gym. Uh, you know, I did a lot of aerobic. I would jog and stuff like that and walk. But... Over the last few years, just because of my age, you know, and the, what people keep telling me, and it's like, you, you got you to gotta lift weights, and you got to do things you wouldn't do. So, you know, I've been going not just to a gym, but going to a, a kind of a class where there's someone telling me, this is what you need to do. And oftentimes, you'll hear them say things to, well, I hear them say things to me like, okay, Activate your abs on that, activate, act, activate your glutes. Okay, activate your quads on that exercise. Okay, okay, I get it. <laughs> what, what I want us to understand here is that we have to learn how to activate our faith. Amen. You know, it's not a mental ascent. It's something different than that. It's where you hear God speak into your soul, in your heart, and, it, and, it, and you, you realize, i got to flip i got to activate. i got to flip that switch, and I'm going to go from natural mode of thinking and pondering and processing to I'm going to believe. I'm going to trust God in this area, and by trusting God, it's going to activate a faith in my heart that's going to cause the potential for that thing to ignite in my mind and in my, in my thoughts. It's going to be as I believe it, and I can see it in my mind's eye to activate it. So Pam and I were doing campus ministry in 1992, 
and the little church that we were a part of dissolved. We got an offer to go move to Los Angeles to go work on the campus at UCLA. And, you know, we started praying about it. And the thought came that God said, no, I don't want you to go. I want you to believe. I want you to start a church here in Lawrence that's going to reach the campus and the community. You're going to reach people on the campus, and you're going to reach people in the community, and you're going to combine these two forces of, of people with wisdom and maturity and, and, and um, age and experience with young people who are ignited by faith and have a certain degree of energy. And so God put that in our hearts to do. So in 1992, we started Morning Star Church in our living room. And, and, and we also started what ultimately became called the greatness. And so Che Lim is still with us, and Nancy Wrights is still our, uh, with us. There was five of us. And uh, Jonathan Hupp, David Hupp's son, Jonathan Hupp, was a freshman at KU. And he became part of that work. And uh, God began to do some amazing things. Uh, that... The, the first semester that we were going, we read 10 college students got saved that first semester. One of them became Jonathan's wife, Reagan, who passed away a, few, uh, a couple years ago. And, uh, you know, soon after that, Ryan and Miriam, you know, we had the encounter at the Mexican restaurant. And then Rick and Barbara Mullen. And then Rich Lorenzo and Ann Lorenzo got saved on campus. And then Dave Diefendorf. And then Jesse the Body Brinson got saved along with Tori. And, and so, you know, there was just this, this thing of growing and making disciples. And so, you know, over time, we, we really aren't a church planning organization. We're a disciple making organization. And when you make disciples, things happen and places you go. So, you know, over time, we wound up planning a church in Manhattan that Jonathan uh, and Reagan and Dave and Becky moved there to start with some other people. And then over time, Dave went to Kansas City and started City Life Church. And so, you know, this, this work. And then, and then, of course, you know, uh, uh, John and Brogan started a church plant here, and then the miracle that happened here. But I want you to, I'm going to say something about, about John Griffith, you know, um, particularly why he's not here. <laughs> you know, I have always, always, always had an incredible fondness for John. Uh, there's just something incredibly special about him. There really is. Uh, when he was at college, he led worship for probably about six different, you know, churches, campus ministries. And, and I mean, he was serving so many different entities in Lawrence. And he didn't have a really, I wouldn't say, an impressive uh, college um, career, you know, anything stand out particularly exceptional about things that he did, except for his, his heart. But I remember praying for him, and as he graduated from KU in engineering, I, I said, man, there's his dad, there was just something about, like, I should ask him if he's ever thought about going into the ministry. He was about ready to go look for uh, our interview with some engineering firms, and I said, hey, before you take a job, have you ever thought about going into the ministry? And he goes, well, not really. I go, hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you come and do like an internship for a season of time and see how you do or how, what, 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 how you like it? And so he wound up saying, okay, I'll do that. And, you know, man, he loved it. And so he, he, we said, man, you're really doing good. Why don't you go at, at KU at the time? We had a large staff. We said, hey, why don't you go to K-State? You have a little more room to operate. And he went there. But I kind, of, I kind of see what's amazing for me, and I think Pam and I, we share this privilege, is to be able to see like how our lives transform. 
how God changed our, and being able to see the lives of other people transform. John Griffith has grown an incredible amount of stature. And in a lot of ways, I find that he is probably one of the greatest persons, his age and his ability to communicate. And not only that, that knowing him as well as I do, he is a real man of character and a real heart for Jesus, someone who's correctable, someone that I, we could go, you know, I or somebody else could go, hey, John, we think this is a little, he would correct, he will make an adjustment. And I just think, man, what an incredible thing that you all have here. And Ryan and Miriam and, and, you know, Bob and Bill and their families. And, you know, Ray, 75, you know, with his expertise in technology. <laughs> you know, it's, it's an amazing thing. And I want to just begin to close on this verse. Hebrews 10. I'm going to skip ahead to, to the verse 35. It says this, Therefore do not throw away your confidence which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance. You have need of endurance. You know, we have to understand that this church is on a journey that's not a sprint. It's a marathon. You know, and you think about that. When you're, when you're running a sprint, you see those sprinters. And it's always kind of amazed me. A lot of times you'll see sprinters and they have like gold chains on. You know, they're sprinting, they got gold chains, and they may even, you know, have like some wristband, you know, like some gold chains on their wrist. I mean, they're, because, you know, they're only going about 100 meters, you know, they can, boom, get there quick. You look at people running those marathons like those Kenyans, they, they don't got anything on. I mean, besides their shirt and their pants. I mean, because when, when you go run a marathon, you're taking that weight, 26 point, I think it's three or four, four miles. 26.2, yeah. So that's a lot of weight. As you think about this church and our lives together, but we're not to throw away the confidence. For in verse 37, it, it says, For a little while, and the coming one will come and not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. This is not talking about losing our salvation. This is just talking about shrinking back. You know, there's a time that we live in right now that a lot of people think that taking the option of shrinking back. Right? We, we, as the body of Christ, as the church of Jesus Christ in the world today, it is our hour to rise and to stand up, not to shrink back, to be who God's called us to be. And you know, we are primed, this church is primed and ready to be the church that God has intended it to be. And it's the temptation for all of us is to think, oh, I just want to go back, right? Maybe sometimes it's like, oh, if we just, you know, if we just settled down, if we just didn't say anything about anything, we could just kind of go back to the way things were. But it says that, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. You know, that's, that's a, we live in an amazing hour, and God is, is preparing us to accomplish His purposes. And the, the, those, those things that we talked about, these, about the kingdom of God, you know, about us being poor in spirit, you know, realizing, man, I, I still have a humility about, man, I need God. I need Jesus. You know, uh, that, man, I'm dependent upon him. And just the idea of activating our faith and not shrinking back. Ryan. You, you want me to stand up here? Sit down. Thank you, Pastor John. You know, I, I just love that because, and, and I hope that you got out of that just a sense of not only the passion for Jesus, but the passion for allowing others to experience the same freedom that John found. And that's something that ever since I've known John, that's been his heart, has been like, man, the thing that Jesus did for me 
and that story about like, hey, John, you can't do this, but if you trust me, I'll do it for you. And he's, he's carried that heart with him ever since I've known him, that, that just that message of, man, listen, your, your life may not be where you want it. You may know there's some things that aren't quite, quite, quite going right, but man, if you trust God, God's going to get you where you need to be. God's going to take you where you need to be if you trust him and if you obey him. And so as we close today, uh, one of the things that, that we like to do is before we come together on Sunday mornings, we have a team of people that's, that's praying for all of us here. And, and so we had a few words this morning um, that hopefully are an encouragement to you. We're going to have our ministry team come forward. So if you can come forward. Uh, and be ready to pray. But some of the some of the things that kind of stood out this morning that we as we were praying is uh, first there was somebody who had uh, just a picture of a vine that was growing and expanding, and really feeling like it was uh, an encouragement from God to to somebody that that you're you things were going well for you. You were growing in your ability and your influence, but God wanted to remind you to stay connected to Him. And so if that's you and you wanted prayer this morning just about, you know, staying more connected to the vine, please come up. The second one, uh, somebody that was feeling abandoned or forgotten, feeling abandoned or forgotten, needing direction from God, like you were in a dry spot, but you just needed uh, to hear from God. Uh, Another one that was similar to that is that somebody had lost their way, that they were somewhat surrounded by darkness and, and just couldn't see, but that God this morning was going to pull back the blinders and allow them uh, to see in a new way. Uh, there's another person here we felt like uh, that you were questioning uh, about whether you should continue in school uh, or go to work. Um, and so there's confusion about that, that we wanted you to come forward and just receive prayer. And maybe God will speak to you about that direction. Um, another person, somebody was focused on finances, that you were scared, that you were to the place where you were like counting every penny. Uh, but God wanted you to free you from that fear of lack this morning. Uh, so if any of those uh, resonate with you, Uh, We would encourage you just as we close service to come forward to receive prayer. And we believe that God is going to to meet you in whatever that circumstance is and begin to see freedom come in that area. So just as we close, a reminder, uh, and hopefully there was an encouragement on your part just as Pastor John was sharing today, um, to sign up for Summit. Again, this is... You know, by uh, tonight at midnight, that early bird is going to shut down. But there is just hopefully that that faith and that passion and that being able to see that the times that we live in is going to require a people of God that is trained and passionate about Jesus, ready to go into the world. And we want to see you be a part of that, be a part of what God is doing at Summit to prepare you uh, for this next this next season, this next school year that we have coming up. So please sign up for that. We'd love to see you there uh, next Saturday at Summit from 9 to 4. So God bless you. Let me pray for us, uh, and then we'll release us. If while I'm praying, if you just want to come forward to the ministry team, that would be awesome. Father, I thank you that you so genuinely care about us, that you love us. And God, that even those words this morning that, that Father, that if somebody is sitting there and they were either challenged by the message or challenged about what it means to live by faith or one of those words, Father, that you would meet them in this place. And so, Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your care for us. Father, encourage us, inspire us to go out and to be vessels of freedom uh, in our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, have a great Sunday. We look forward to seeing you all at Summit next Saturday.